and welcome to another video by Adrian Dean from Cure Electric. In this video, I'm going to be talking through fault finding on a ring final circuit. This will help you in your AM2 or in the 2391 qualification. Now, the first thing that we want to do is we want to test this ring end to end. So I've got a multifunction tester. We need to make sure that it's working. So we've got a few checks to do first. If any of you have watched my video on um, how this multifunction tester works, and click the link in the corner of the screen now. Effectively, the checks that we want to do is we want to make sure the leads are compliant, we've got no damage to the leads, that we've got enough battery in the unit. Now, when I put this battery on, it tells me I've got 9.1 volts, okay? And then what I want to do is I want to put, I need to know the leads and check the meters working. So if I just hold this up here for you, when you put the leads together, you'll notice that one side is springy and one side is solid. To get the best connection, you want the two solid sides put together, okay? Like so, two solid sides all the way through. And when we look at this, we should be getting a reading. Okay, once you've got that resistance there, then you need to know the leads. So I'll take that null off, null the leads, they're now at zero. Okay, so my meter has now been nulled. I then check, Meters open, I'm not recording anything, and meters closed. Okay. And that should go all the way down to zero. There we go. All right. So we know the meter works. The first thing that we come across is testing of a ring. You'll notice as well that we then do R1 testing, which is a little R1, and that is the live conductor all the way around the circuit end to end. So it's end to end only. We've also got RN, which is the neutral, and little r2, which is gonna be the CPC. You'll notice they're all little r's, okay? Because when you're testing a ring, it's little r, until you've added them together and divided by four, and then it becomes a big r1, r2 value. So this is just end to end measurements. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna measure end to end on the line conductor. And you're gonna get a reading. Now let's say that that reading is 0.30 ohms. So 0.30 ohms. Next, when you test the neutral conductor, what you wanna do is compare it against this value here, okay? So because we've got 0.3 ohms, the line conductor is the same CSA and it's the same length. So we should be getting the same reading. If we don't, then you're fault finding. And this is what I want you guys to take away from this as well, is that when you're testing, if anything goes wrong, instantly you're fault finding. So I hear a lot of people that get to year three and they say, I've never done fault finding. We don't do much of it at work. If you're doing testing, then you are fault finding. That is why you do the dead test. You're, you're fault finding before you put the circuit into service. Okay, so just remember that. So when I come along to test the RN, it should be exactly the same as the R1. And if it's not, I'm fault finding. If it's higher than the R1, then I've probably got a loose connection or I'm clamped onto the sheathing somewhere in one of the terminals. If it's lower than the R1, then I'm fault finding again because that means that I've got a fault with the R1 value. And then they should both be the tolerance. And I'll give you that tolerance in a second. So let's just say that I've tested it, there's no faults found. I know that because I've got 0 0.5 three zero ohms, the same as my line conductor. Now I come to the R2. If I'm testing twin and earth, for instance, then I know that my R2 value is gonna be 1.67 times higher. And for those of you that don't know, that 1.67 times comes from 2.5, okay, divided by 1.5. And that ratio is 1.6, and it's 6, 6, something, something, something. And we round that up to 1.67. So that's where that 1.67 value comes from. It's 2.5, the CSA of the line conductor, divided by 1.5, which is the CSA of the CPC. And that will help you remember that figure. Now, if I was doing twin and earth, this value is going to be 1.67 times higher. If it was the same CSA, so let's say it was doing singles and it was 2.5 and it was the same length and the same resistance, uh, same length, same CSA, 
then the R2 value would be exactly the same. But I'm going to do it for twin and earth for the moment, just so you can see the comparison. So 1.67 times 0.3 comes out at 0.50 ohms. Now we do have a tolerance with these measurements, and that tolerance is 0.05 ohms. Okay. So you should be getting around that at those figures. Now, the way that I explain it to people is that if you've got a flat twin and earth cable and all you did was left turn, left turn, left turn, left turn all the time, it's exactly the same as what happens on a racetrack. The internal uh, runner, the runner on the inside track is going to get the shorter distance, which is why they stagger the start. So everybody runs the same distance. So that's why we get a bit of a torrent. Sometimes you've done more lefts than you've done right, or you've stripped a bit more cable off here or there. So that's where this sort of tolerance comes from. Now, if you haven't got that and it's not within that tolerance, you don't go any further, okay? You need to fault find that part of the circuit first before you proceed. Once you've got everything tailored and you've checked that, the results against everything, then you can proceed to the next step. Once we've done the end-to-ends, we we'll check that they're within tolerance. The next we're going to do is the R1 plus R2 divided by four. Okay. And essentially we're going to put in 0.3 ohms, so 0 0.30. And then we've got an R2 of 0 0.50. But 0 0.3 plus 0.5 equals 0 0.8. And if we divide that by four, it equals 0 0.2. So what we're going to end up here is a 0 0.20 ohm resistance. Now, why do we do that? Why do we calculate the R1, R2 resistance? Well, that's simple because if I was to, if I was to test this in the same way that we test a radial circuit. So let's say I connect Let's say I connect my ring into it's the same as what I would do with a radial circuit. It doesn't matter whether I do either end or this end. If I do both sides at the same time, you'll see the problem. Okay. So if I connect this like I would a radial circuit, my R1 and my R2s are together. What's going to happen is that as I test at different parts of the circuit, so I'm going to be testing here between R1 and R2. Well, the electrons are going to travel the easiest around the smallest part of the circuit. So most of the electrons are going to travel here in the small circuit. So I'll get a low reading here. As I work my way into the circuit, this loop down here is going to get bigger and bigger. Some electrons will go that way, but the majority will come this way. So my reading will increase slightly. As I get to the midway point, I'll have equal electrons moving left and right through the circuits and through these loops. So that will be my highest reading. And then as I work my way back down this leg of the circuit, the readings will get lower and lower and lower. Now, the problem is with that is when you're testing on a ring and if all the cables are hidden, you won't know whether that's a good reading or a bad reading. All the reading is going to be all over the place. OK, so a long time ago, someone smarter than me realized that if you do a figure of eight and we connect opposite ends of the ring so opposite legs so if i connect the live from this leg of the ring to the cpc on that leg of the ring and then do the same with this leg of the ring so i'll cross this cpc with the live into a, that figure of eight configuration that you would have heard a lot about at college. Now, when I test between live and earth here, the electrons have the same path to take. So they've got to come down the live. This live crosses over to the CPC, goes all the way around the circuit and then back into here. And it doesn't matter where I test, those electrons have got to do the longest leg all the way back, the longest loop. And my readings will be the same at every point on the circuit. And that's what I'm checking those readings against. I'm going to calculate my R1, R2 divided by four, and that's going to give me my large R1, R2 figure, and that is what I'm going to compare it against. And the figure that I record on the certificate is going to be the highest reading. Now, when I come to do this 
circuit, I'm going to get a lot of faults. And I'm going to show you how that is fault finding, okay, by doing R1, R2 and R1, Rn, because R1, Rn is exactly the same as this. I would just swap the R2 for Rn, I would recalculate it, and then that would give me a figure to check with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how all that tallies up and how that is fault finding and how that proves polarity of a circuit. Okay, so you can see that I've now set this board up and I've given each socket a letter. So this is socket A, B, C, D, and finally E over there. Okay, and I've put a table up to sort of show what we're talking about. So I've got R1 plus R2, R1 plus Rn, and whether polarity was confirmed. Okay, so we've got our circuit set up. So R1, R2, figure of eight configuration. And now I'm going to theoretically go around and test every socket. So if I test R1, R2 here um, and I'll break the switch, I will get a reading. So R1, R2, did I get a reading? Yes, I did. I then go to socket B and I test R1, R2. Now, because I've got the neutral in the wrong conductor in the wrong terminal here, I'm not going to get a reading. So the answer is no. Socket B, I didn't get a reading. I then come along to socket C. Again, no reading. And then socket D. So socket D, I do get a reading. A socket D, I've got a reading, even though I've got the live conductor in the CPC, uh, sorry, in the earth terminal, and I've got the CPC in the live terminal. My meter cannot tell which way around those are. All it knows is that I'm going to get a reading. The electrons are flowing in through one terminal, round the circuit, and then back in through the other terminal. Socket E, checking R1 or 2 I'm not going to get a reading. Now, if you don't then test R1, Rn, you haven't proved polarity, okay? And it amazes me how many apprentices I speak to where they tell me that their employers don't do R1, Rn at work. And I can't help thinking that the reason for that is it's not on the schedule of test results. So if it's not on the schedule of test results, do we really have to do it? It's a good question. And Hopefully, by the end of this video, you will see that if we don't do R1 RN testing of a ring final circuit, we're not actually proving polarity. And I wish the IET would do something about the model form that, you know, it's in guidance notes free, it's in uh, on-site guide, it's in every testing manual that we, we've ever read, and yet it's not on the model form. So I don't know why, it seems ridiculous. And uh, I think I've heard the E5 guys call it one of the hidden tests. Okay, or unknown tests or something like that, one of the hidden tests. So let's connect that up into a figure of eight then. So this time, instead of connecting my R1, R2 together, I'm going to connect R1, Rn. So this goes down to there. And then this leg comes over here. So the live from leg one is into the neutral of leg two. And the, line, the neutral from leg one is with the line from leg two. Now we do the same thing again. We go around each socket. And here I'm testing between live and neutral. So here I'm operating the switch at the same time. And I've got a reading. So polarity is correct. Okay. I then come to socket B. And here I'm going to test between live and neutral. And even though I've got reverse polarity, I'm going to get an R1, R2. So yes. But because I don't have R1, R2 and R1, Rn, polarity is not confirmed. I then come along to socket C and I test neither neutral and I don't get a reading. So again, polarity is not confirmed. I then go along to socket D and I test between sorry, live and neutral at the bottom. And again, I don't get a reading. So polarity is not confirmed. 
And then finally socket E, live and neutral at the bottom, and I don't get any polarity. Now, hopefully you can see that, oh, okay, socket A, I've got good polarity. If we look at socket B, I got R1, R2. Sorry, I didn't get R1, R2, but I've got R1, Rn. So that then tells me that I've got reverse polarity, okay, of R1 and Rn. These are the wrong way around. If I look at, look at socket C, well, I didn't get anything, so everything's the wrong way around. Socket D, I've got R1, R2, but I didn't get R1, Rn. So that tells me that I've got reverse polarity on the live and CPC. Again, if I come down to socket E, I didn't get anything, so everything's the wrong way around. So it's, it couldn't be any worse connected if, if you try. Now, again, look around these circuit sockets, so this would have worked fine. B, this socket here, even though I've got reverse polarity, this would have worked fine. A lot of things would have been plugged in, they would have worked absolutely fine. The danger is with this socket, is that if I switch it off, I'm switching the neutral conductor off. The danger with that is the appliance will appear like it's dead, but actually it will be very much live inside. So I could take some casing off or take something apart, and I've still got that danger, that hazard of electricity being there. So this is very dangerous. If I look at socket C, then the live is going to, into my earth terminal, which means that if anything was metallic on that appliance that's plugged in, it's now become live. There's a, a risk of electric shock. Same with D and with E, I've got neutral earth reversal, but the socket would have still worked because unless I had an RCD present, on a PME system, for example, the electrons just need a, a route back to the tran uh, transformer. So the electrons would have flown down the earth all the way back to the transformer, happy days. Even on a TN system, TNS system, um, the earthing would have still provided the electrons with a flow back to the transformer, back to ground, back to earth, I would have got a, um, a circuit working. So as you can see, it's very difficult. Now for all those people at home that are saying, well, do you know what? We don't do our one R in because all we do is we plug in a socket tester. Well, two things, a socket tester doesn't tell you the condition of the cable. I know I've just put yes and no in here, but you would put in values and then you would record the highest on the certificate. But you would see whether you've got a high resistance at each socket and where there was those resistances are. If you had a high resistance at the front of the socket, then you would take the socket off and you would test the cables at the back. And then you would see if you've got a low resistance at the back of the socket, but you were getting a high resistance at the front of the socket, then you would know that the socket has broken down inside and the high resistance is due to the accessory itself. Change the socket and that should solve the issue. If you're getting a high resistance behind the socket, then that's fault finding. You're then going back to looking for that fault and finding out where that high resistance is coming from. Now again with this one here with the socket tester, A they don't check the resistance so you don't know if it's a good reading or not, it just tells you we've got A reading. But with a neutral earth reversal those socket testers cannot tell the difference. So this would not have been picked up and it, that is why it's so important to do R1 RN testing as well. I hope this video has been of some use to you. And as always, please like, share, and subscribe to get these important messages out there. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.